from Mark's Gospel. He rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, and of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the Episcopal Church, and for that matter, the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, and many Presbyterian Church observances, although they're under no rules to do it, we have a three-year lectionary. And in year B, with, in which we are currently, we read from Mark's gospel most weeks. And so every three years, we get Mark's version of this story today, the rebuke of Peter. And so it was 15 years ago that my wife and son, who's now 26, and daughter, who's now almost 21, and I were sitting in the pew at St. Mary the Virgin in 46th Street between 6th and 7th Avenues in Manhattan. It was a cold, cold February day, unlike today. And it was the second Sunday in Lent. And we were sitting right underneath the pulpit. The pulpit is unbelievably high and mighty in the Church of St. Mary the Virgin. And it's, the rector was tall. And so he was there, as he put it, standing 16 feet above contradiction, looking down and preaching. And he was serious, and he was also a great guy. And my daughter was not serious about church, and she curled up under my wife's fur coat, which she had put aside because, like every Manhattan room, it's overheated. And she was under the coat, and the rector was in the pulpit, and he cited as his text from this gospel the following words. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, and you heard my daughter from underneath the coat say, killed? Echoing through the church. And he looked down and said, yes, Anna, killed. And I'm mindful out of the mouths of babes and sucklings come the most extraordinary things and the absolute truth. And she lived out in her innocence and irreverence, Peter. She was Peter to that crowd 15 years ago. Who's Peter to you today? Was Peter Satan as we know it, horns, pitchfork, tail? No. Was he that to Jesus? No. He was one of the very first called along with his brother Andrew. He was one of the closest disciples. He was one of those present on the mountain of transfiguration. He became prince of the apostles, first bishop of Antioch and Rome, the one to whom all bishops point as their prime bishop even today in the Western church. No. He wasn't a figure of evil, a figure of Dante's expression. But to Jesus at that moment, he was Satan. Why? Because he was tempting Jesus to go against the will of God and turn to the will of man. In the words of today's gospel, to look at man's will and not God's will, to live in the world of men and not in the world of God. We experience in today's Old Testament reading the establishment of the first covenant, the old covenant, as it were, between God and his people between Abraham and God, between Abram and God, Sarah and God, and Sarai and God, and the name change from 
Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah that signified that covenant, that change from dwelling in the imperfection of our world and our will and striving toward the fulfillment, the completion, which is what perfection means, perfecto, completedness. It doesn't mean flawlessness, it means completeness. The perfection that lies in front of us and is possible in God. And to put behind us, to put behind us what would tempt us away from the will of God and the perfection which he offers to us. Who is Satan to you? Anna was Satan in that church that day, astonished that Jesus would have to be killed. My wife is sitting here off camera and is Satan to me on a daily basis. Get your hand out of the shot. She is Satan to me on a daily basis because she looks out for me and only me. I'm her first priority along with the children and the cat who was causing all kinds of trouble today. And she puts my well-being over everything else. And I'm glad there's someone in the world who does that. And I give thanks for that. And yet that will take me away from what I'm called to do by God if I follow that temptation all the time. There have been times, uh, I'll pick Anna Waters as a fictitious example because Anna can take it. When Anna Waters will call and she'll say, don't get it, you're off duty. She would never do that to you, Anna. And I'll say, yeah, it's my calling to get that. Anna could be in trouble and I'm gonna get it. And I answer the phone. My wife was being protective of me and my time or whatever it might be. Of course, she's never done that. And I'm not saying that she has, but there's an example where our loved ones looked out for us and sometimes take us away from what we're called to do. What is it in your life? Last week I spoke of the stockbroker who could turn the time clock in his office and predate and pre-time a trade ticket, thereby making money for himself and his clients illegally. He could do it and it was wrong to do. We're faced every day in our personal lives and our professional lives with opportunities to make our lives better, to make our lives easier, to make our lives exactly what we might want them to be. And yet we know in our heart of hearts, what it will really do is make them worse and lead toward a life which won't be better, which will simply put off till tomorrow what could be done right now. Get thee behind me, Satan. Because with Satan behind us, we can look with clear eyes to the future without the noise. My daughter, Anna, speaking up from underneath the fur coat on the pews and her muffled tones, my wife looking out for me saying, you're tired, don't do any more work today, is a wonderful reminder that we need to look out for ourselves in this world. And yet, the resistance of those temptations does make us stronger. It makes us stronger spiritually. It makes us stronger in our personal lives. It makes us stronger in our professional lives. That Jesus himself was tempted by his best friend or one of his best friends is an example to me that even the son of God, even God himself experience something of what I and you and everyone experiences. And so we in the midst of Lent, in the midst of this 
depersonalizing and dehumanizing season of COVID isolation where we wish we could be close. We wish that our family didn't need to be in Florida all the time and could be with us in old Greenwich. We wish that we could be around the Thanksgiving table, wherever that may be. Well, next year, I want to close with those beautiful words from that sequence hymn where we looked at different parts of the day and asked God to be with us. The final verse. Lord of all gentleness, Lord of all calm, whose voice is contentment, whose presence is balm. Be there at our sleeping and give us, we pray, your peace in our hearts, Lord, at the end of the day. Amen.